once a year, come up and uh, show us how it's done, one example on the first one. Anything you want, put anything you want in there and show us how you keep track of it. Okay, so I'll have, I have a terrible color, I think. I'll pick white, do white, and you can all see that. Okay. There we go. How about x equals 7? How about it? Sounds good. Now I'm going to rewrite this. Seven plus three. Okay. Then we solve two times seven, which is fourteen. So y equals fourteen plus three. And then y equals seventeen. All right. So how do you clearly, like, if you were writing this down and you're going to do this a bunch of times, how do you make sure you understand that x that x is seven goes with y is seventeen? Make sure that you understand that when 7 goes in, 17 comes out. Or input to be x equals 7, and their output is y equals 17. Okay, if, but if you did this several times, and then I was looking at your homework from an outside, you know, I'm an outside observer here, how would I quickly identify that you put in 7 and got out 17 without like having to hunt through your work? You see what I'm saying? Yeah. How would you, any, any, absolutely any way you want, there's no right answer, no wrong answer here. The right answer is just a way that tells me that x was 7 and y was 17, or in went 7 and out came 17, however you want to tell me. So you want to invent a way, or you can pass it off? And exactly what I'm looking for. What did you put in? What did you get out? Right? Very simple, right? Uh, great. Thank you, Nate. Well, applause for Nate. He did a great job. <laughs> what I wanted. Okay. Anybody else want to show us one more for this one? Okay, so what, what input output do you have? Uh, one and six. Uh, one and six. Yeah. So the T chart has, like, it doesn't have that line across, so you're just going to be careful, make sure that they're right across from each other, but there's another pretty standard way. <coughs> Any other ways that we can keep track of this is what I put in and this is what I got out? Any other different approach? Did I ask you to do it differently from the T chart? Is that, did I do that in this class? No? Different, different period I did that then. Let's get one more way that's different from any of these that we've seen so far. How many of you use some version of the T-chart? All right, so there's other things out there. Somebody used something else. Or even if you didn't do it, and you can think of any other way that we can keep track of, something went in and something came out. Just put it in brackets, X and Y. Just X and Y, so like, like that with a comma? Yeah. yeah. That's pretty standard, right? So, uh, can you do one in your head? Five and thirteen. Five and thirteen. We already did five and thirteen. Can you do one in your head real quick? Can you think? Three and nine. Three and nine. Everybody agree with three and nine? All right, three and six is three and nine. All right, so 
this way, this way, this way, this way, all different and 100% effective ways of communicating. This is what ended, this is what came out. Okay? It's, it's a very simple thing in, in math, uh, equations, input, output, the word function, definitions, graphs, they don't have to be intimidating things. Okay? That's what we're working on doing, is making things that may be intimidating less intimidating. Okay? Uh, let's jump over here to this one. A little bit more complicated function, so we need to be a little bit careful. Uh, would someone like to show us how to say input negative three and show us what the output is? So I'm going to take the input and you find the output. Maybe? No. Thirteen. There we go. Healthy. Negative three gives us twenty-six. Negative three gives us twenty-six. Okay. <coughs> Anybody do negative three and get twenty-six as well? Just like coincidence. Okay. Maybe. Okay. Maybe. Or maybe you were right. I don't, I don't know what you did about that. Uh, well, let's see real quick. Uh, we can kind of say negative three squared is nine. Right? Nine. Oh crap! I did it wrong. I said oh. thirty. Yeah, yeah thirty. Yeah, I did it wrong. I just did it. Fourteen. You got twenty-six. As well? I thought negative 28. Oh, negative 28. Oh, we got like three different things going on. It's Alright, alright. Uh, <coughs> and we'll clear the way. Negative 28. Let's see. We'll find out together. Why? I got 38 to negative 3. Negative 3 squared times 2 times negative 3 plus 5. We're going to talk about this. Here uh, in a little bit, but uh, this would be three times nine plus let's say six plus five, so we have twenty-seven plus six plus five. It's thirty-eight. With the negatives and the squaring and all that kind of stuff, there's lots of room to make mistakes. So that's a common common. So I'll have you go ahead and, well, any questions at all about any of this? Because if you don't have your homework, we're sure how to do it, right? Because it makes, makes sense. Yeah? We're going to have that ready for next time, hopefully. We'll just have that and we'll turn that into the late box and we'll be all caught up. All right. Um, all right so let's go on to the next thing. Um, we're going to talk about a... Uh, a rational expression. What's a what's a rational number? Can anybody tell me what a rational number is? Then we're gonna do what an expression is. Rational number is a good one. I'm sure you've heard it before, you can recall what a rational number is. It's a, a number that's either negative or positive. Um, I don't know if it can be a decimal or not. Uh, it's true that these numbers can be negative or positive. You got to be a little bit. Is it a whole number? 
Uh, a negative or a positive whole number with zero, those are what we call the integers. Right. Okay. Right, let's, let's just draw a little chart here. So let's go with the biggest group we have. This would be the real numbers. Okay. If there's real numbers, that implies there's some numbers over here that are not real numbers that are some other kind of number, which we'll worry about much, much later than today. Okay? Does anybody remember what those if they're not real, they're imaginary. Remember the imaginary numbers? <coughs> We'll, we'll talk about those later, but we, we've been dealing with real numbers for a long, long time. Okay, let's see, we've got our, okay. inside all the real numbers, so all the numbers inside here are all real numbers, they're just uh, smaller classes. Well, it's not really small, it's just uh, we've got our, um, let's see if I can get this right, rational numbers, okay. That are irrational numbers. For rational numbers, we get integers. Inside the integers, we get the whole numbers slash counting numbers. And I actually I made a video about this, about the different kinds of numbers, and I, I defined the, uh, the counting numbers or the whole numbers, and uh, a little bit of controversy broke out. There were like two comments that were from people, I don't know who they were, they said, actually the whole of the counting numbers are such and such, and uh, it turns out the whole and counting numbers, there's a little bit of a dispute about what defines them. Okay, so uh, we'll just go with my definition in this class, which is the definition in the book. Okay, what are the whole numbers? Let's start like small. What are the whole numbers? One. I'm taking numbers. One, two, three, four. All right. Things I can count. Sometimes we include zero, sometimes we don't. Okay? And if you include zero, you're right. If you don't include zero, you're also right. Because there's no real standard definition that people uh, just adhere to. Okay, so a little bit more of these numbers we find in the integers. So all integers are whole numbers, not all, or all uh, whole numbers are integers, but not all integers are whole numbers. So what are integers? Negative and positive, these kinds of numbers, and zero. Zero, one, two, three, forever in this direction, but also forever in the negative direction. There's our integers. So these are all rational numbers. But there are some rational numbers that don't fit in the integers. So what's a rational number? OK. Some decimals are rational. Some decimals are irrational. In fact, some decimals are even integers, if you say like 0.0. Fractions? Fractions. Fractions. OK. Anything that is a fraction that can be expressed as one integer over another integer. OK. So a positive or a negative number that you can write over another number. OK. One half. Positive 45, 370 seconds. Any way, any, any number that can be expressed as one number divided by another number. All right? And some numbers cannot be expressed that way. It cannot be written as a number divided by another number. Can you think of any of those numbers? They have special names, a lot of them. X. X would be. I could guess, but X is a, uh, it's real general. These ones actually have a specific name and they are, they are always the same number. There's a couple of these numbers in the back there. Pi. Pi, right? 3.14159, and that's how many digits I know currently. Square root of negative one. one. Square root of negative one, imaginary. It's not even real. Okay. Yes? The square root of two. The square root of two. That's irrational. Okay. It is not possible to find a number that you can, you know, as one integer over another that will be equal to the square root of two. I would 
go into the, the amazing stories of the square root of two not being rational, but uh, we'll save it maybe for another time. E is another number. It's uh, 1.618 and something. I think that's right. Or maybe I'm, no, I'm thinking of, uh, I'm thinking of a different number. This one is phi. E is 2.718281828. And then it goes on forever and doesn't repeat. And it doesn't just keep going on 1828, 1828. If it did, if it did repeat like that predictably forever, then it would be a rational number. There's a way to take those and write them as one number divided by another. Okay? But these ones that go on forever and they don't repeat, they don't have any patterns that are predictable, they're called irrational. Right? So we're talking about rational numbers, they are fractions. Right? That's where we started just a second ago. When can we simplify a rational expression? First of all, rational numbers are fractions, so rational expression must be some kind of a fraction. There's something about an expression in it. Okay? And simply put, an expression is, in, in algebra, is anything with uh, operators, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, and some variables in there. Right. So that would be called an expression. However you want to write that out, that, that would be an expression. Okay? So 2x plus 3, that's an expression. Right. Anything like that. So the question is though, and this is an important question because it's a mistake that gets made a lot uh, and that I don't want you to make, uh, so I'm going to help you with it. When can we simplify a rational expression? What is hmm? like maybe 2x plus 3 and 4x plus 3? But there's a rational expression. So we're talking about rational numbers, right? Fractions with variables. We're simplifying fractions, but fractions with variables in them. We're just throwing a variable in there, and all of a sudden uh, we start making mistakes. Let's start off simple with a regular old rational number and ask, can we simplify it and why? Okay. Like this, um, let's say 18 over 15. Okay. Can we simplify 18 over 15? Don't turn it into a mixed number, that's not simple. No, turning into decimal, by simplify I mean write as a fraction, still another fraction. I'm looking for 6 over 5. Here, let me, let me write this 15 8 because that seems to be confusing too many people. 15 18. So now it's not improper. 5 over 6. So we're going to write this down to exactly what is happening, okay? Because it's ignoring what's really going on here that causes so many problems. So in not too long of a time, in, in the fairly near future, if you pay attention today and you, you take this to heart and, and uh, you write it down in your notes and you can revisit it and explain it to a fifth grader, then it's going to help you out quite a bit. So why is it that 15 18s cancels or supplies or whatever down to 5 6? Okay. I'm going to write that over here because in my previous two classes I had to come back to these two words repeatedly common factor. Okay. This is the key right there, a factor. If you don't have a common factor, then we are out of luck. You cannot simplify this rational expression. Okay. So let's break this down. It's a very simple example so that we can do more complex examples by following this example. So what is that common factor they have? Three. Three. Okay. So here's which one you want to We're looking at this as three times five and three times six. Realizing in our minds, this is what makes these numbers what they are. 3 times 5 and 3 times 6. Well, I have two 
numbers that are multiplied in the numerator, that's like what I do when I multiply two fractions together. So you know what I can do is make this two fractions. And if I multiply straight across, I get 3 times 5 over 3 times 6, right? And that would be the same as 15 over 18, right? Okay. But here's what's actually happening when you simplify a fraction. Right? All of these things are happening in the math convention. Okay? When you write this down, all that stuff actually happens. Whether you wrote it down or not. Right? Does that make sense? At least that's uh, kind of making a fantasy story out of this. It's not. But all this stuff had to happen in order for this to work, right? In other words, it has to be possible to take a fraction that you want to simplify and write it like this as a product of two fractions. And this could, we could state this, this law in lots of different ways, but this I think is the simplest one. In all my experiences, it's the simplest way. It needs to be possible to write the fraction you're talking about as the product of two fractions. And if one of those fractions, something nice happens, what is 3 divided by 3? 1. 1. And what is 1 times 5 sixths? 5 sixths. 6. Okay. When we use this word canceling, it's very vague, it's not very well defined, and it may be defined incorrectly in your head if you're not quite sure what's going on here. Okay. But this is well defined. What it is is we can rewrite it as a product of two fractions. One of the fractions is one, it's equal to one, and one times whatever you have left over, uh, like the older simpler fraction, right? The five six is the simplified fraction. All right, let's take um, three x over twenty seven and ask, can that be simplified? Why not? Because there's an x. Okay, there's an x. I mean, there's, there's no shame in like saying there's an x, and so that may change things. What we need to ask is, does the numerator have a common factor with the denominator, or can we write it like this? Yeah, three. So you think three? Like, well, I don't have the right color here. Three. Over three. We're hoping to cancel three instead of three, right? Hopefully the three divides the three. Okay? And so what's your suggestion for what this other fraction would be so that when we multiply these two fractions together, we get three x over twenty seven? What would we have here? Is that somebody in my class? Or no. There's on the phone in the hallway. Oh, great. What we should put here? X and what we should should we put down here? Okay. If we multiply two fractions, we always multiply them straight across. Agreed? Okay. And we talked about why we multiply them straight across, why we don't cross multiply. Hopefully, we'll going into all that detail, you could explain that to a third grader, or maybe a fifth grader, why that is. Okay, so we multiply straight across. Do we get this original fraction? 3 times x is 3x. That's what 3 times that, or 3 next to x is, uh, what that means. And 3 times 9, of course, is 27. We know our multiplication, at least of, of small numbers. So yes, this product is equal to this fraction, and what's three divided by three? One, one still, and x over nine is apparently a simplified version of three x over twenty-seven. Okay. Well, I like that you said no. It's challenging just to think. You know, is it as easy as I think it is? Can I just cancel out the threes? Well, it has to be able to be written like this. Let's try um, fifteen x squared over, uh, oh yeah, let's do 25, that's a good suggestion, and x, there's your number. Can this be simplified? Yes. Okay, let's just start off easy. Let's start with a number that you think you can cancel from the numerator and denominator. What do you feel like it can be? Uh, five, okay? Five, if it's possible to cancel five, and this is true every time you want to simplify a fraction, the next one we do here is going to be the real, the, like what we're building up to, a, a way to explain why we can't simplify it. Okay, if it's possible to cancel the thing you want to cancel, five in this case, we have to be able to write it as five over five times some other fraction gives us the original fraction. Let's fill it in. Is it possible? Can we do five times something gives us fifteen x squared? Three x squared. Use that x squared. Okay. Uh, maybe we could do something with the x's in a minute. 
What about here in the denominator? What could we put here so that five times if that thing is 25x? Five, five, five x. Okay. Just double check and confirm. Can we multiply across the numerator and get this one? Yes. Can we multiply across the numerator or denominator and get this? Yes. Okay. So five times five, and we have one. One times three x squared over five x is a simplified version of this original fraction. What else do you feel like might cancel as well? X's. One of the x's, so only one factor of x, so let's just check that out. Do we have to write this down every time, go through all of these steps every time we want to cancel something? No, but if you have trouble, and if you, if you uh, fall victim to the weeping kitten theorem, which I'll explain to you in a moment, then you should. You should do this for a while until you really understand what we're doing here. Okay, so let's try it. Can we cancel out an x? Can we write it as x over x times some other fraction? What can we write in the numerator? 3x, let's check, x times 3x is 3x squared, because we can do the x times the x, and that's the definition of x squared. And what goes in the denominator? Five. Five. A five. x times five does give me five x. So yes, this x over x times 3x over five does create the same fraction, and so x divides x, and I get one. And I'm left with 3x over five. It might seem as simple to you as looking and seeing, well, there's fives and there's x's, and they're the same, and I can cross them out, and then I have a new fraction. Okay, so let me give you this one. Uh, 2x plus 1 over uh, 2x. Let's take a little vote. How many of you feel like this could be canceled? So that we can cross up two x's, have something simpler. Okay. How many of you feel like this is a trick question and that we can't cancel out the two x's? And how many of you feel like you know why we can't cancel out the two x's? Okay, well, let's talk about why. Okay, so we've done three examples here, three more, a little more basic, but we keep building up. You have different things we want to cancel out. Here, we wound up canceling in all a 5x, right? And here, we want to cancel out a 2x, okay? Let's go for it. Let's try and cancel out the 2x in the exact same way that we've been canceling out uh, factors in, uh, in other things, okay? So, we have the hope that we can cancel out the 2x. If this has to be possible, if this isn't possible, then it's definite proof that you cannot simplify this fraction. So let's figure out what this other fraction has to be so that we can multiply straight across and get the same thing. Let's start in the denominator because that's the easiest thing. 2x times what will give us this 2x? 1. Easy. All right, now let's go to the numerator. 2x times, maybe putting parentheses will help you remember. I want to multiply 2x by this numerator. That means whatever's here, everything has to get multiplied. In other words, if we need to distribute, then distribution needs to happen. So I distribute, say, 2x times what will give me this 2x? 1. Okay, here's the problem. What am I going to multiply 2x by to get 1? Now, like, I have to lose an x. So multiplying this 2x times, I mean, I just don't see a way. What's that? Put in 2x. Right here? Put a 2x here? Yeah. Negative two x. I could suggest in every class, so it's a it's a good thought. Like two x, negative two x. They tend to cancel each other out. But remember, we're not adding them together; we're multiplying. So if we put a negative two x there, what's two x times negative two x? Negative four x. What? Squared. Right. You got an x times an x. You got negative four x squared. It's a good idea. I like it. It's great to suggest it, but we got to investigate it, and we realize. That would work if we were adding, but not for multiplying. So, good idea. It unfortunately didn't work. Any, any other ideas? What could we put here so the 2x times that thing will give us a 1? No ideas? Huh? A half. One half. All right, so what's 2x times a half? Let's kind of break it up into its own problem here. Let's. You know, commutative property says we can reorder these and multiply them any way we want. 2 over 1 times 1 over 2, well, that's 1, right? But we have that x. And 
x is still there. So I can get 1x, but I can somehow lose that x. Do you see the problem? Any other ideas? Any other way to multiply by, multiply 2x by something and wind up getting just a 1? So, now, we still feeling like we should be able to cancel out the 2x, or do you see why we cannot? We can't do it, right? Because it's not a common what? Factor. Factor. All right? Okay, let me uh, do this with you. We're going to define very, very well what a factor is. What if that plus 1 plus plus 2x squared would you able to? Instead of 1, it was 2x squared? Let me erase what I have so that's what I don't want to do. That would change things. That would change things. And we'll do that in just a second. OK? Um, let's see. So we're going to define factor. It's going to be very specific. It's going to be airtight. There's going to be no arguing with it whatsoever. Okay. So factor. What makes a factor exactly? And I'll start you off. This is a very standard math way of defining things. How you, a lot of you start off. If I want to define what a factor is, I'll use algebra and I'll call something a factor of something else. Okay. So it starts off if a is a factor of B, and I'll try and, I'll try and uh, use a script so that it's distinguished from other articles and things like that. So if A is a factor of B, then I'm going to take all your standard responses away from you. Uh, then A goes into B, right? You want to say A goes into B. This is going to be a really common thing. But what does goes into mean? Okay, go with that. What do you say in there? Multiply, Multiply what? A and B. Multiply A and B? Here, let's use some specific number examples. If 3, if 3 is a factor of 15, do I multiply 3 times 15? I don't know. Okay, B is divisible by A. That's good. So there's actually a definition of divisibility that we have to get into. And I know that that seems, I know, kind of harsh. What does it mean for one number to be divisible by another? It's in our heads. Well, they don't have to have a common factor like 3 and 15 don't have common, well, I guess 3 is a factor of 3. But if 3 divides 15, I mean, can you, just off to the side of this example, can you prove to me 3 is a factor of 15? What's the proof? If you go up the, if you factor down 15. Okay, if you do the prime factorization. Yeah. Good, if you do the prime factorization, we'll write it a little bit differently over here. You'll find that 3 times 5 is 15, right? That's the key to factor being a factor of something else. If you're a factor of some other number, you can be multiplied by some number and you get the number that you claim to be a factor of. Right? So if A is a factor of B, just like we proved it here for 15, then A times something else, K, we'll get to that in a second, equals B. Would you agree to that? Then A times K equals B. If 3 is a factor of 15, then 3 times something equals 15. But can this just be any old thing? Well, okay. What kind of things could it not be? Um, a larger number? Um, well, it could be larger than oh, yeah. 15, <laughs> but it must not be another factor of B. Yeah. Okay, a factor of B. Could it be like a decimal number? No. No, it's, if 3 times 0.2 is some other number, that doesn't mean that 3 is a factor of that, right? You have to multiply what kind of numbers together? Integers. Integers, yeah, even better than whole numbers, integers. Okay? So we say where? K 
is an integer. Now, this is just something I'm going to share with you, my, my geekiness about math. I love this definition. I love all mathematical definitions. Go to the, the English dictionary and look up the definition to any word. And take the word literally. It's actually in a new, what does, what does the word literally mean? Actual? Like, this actually, literally happened. What's the opposite of literally? Figurative. Figurative. People use literally in the wrong context. Yes, I literally am so hungry I could eat a horse. I literally waited. I waited literally for, for three days in line at the DMV. I literally, we, li we say we literally do things we don't literally do, right? But in new, new uh, versions of the dictionary, uh, like even if you, if you look it up, like define on, on Google search, the whole thing that pops up in one of the definitions is, you know, for emphasis, figuratively. A definition, and one of the definitions of literally is now figuratively. So a definition of the word literally is the opposite of what literally means. So you can use an English word wrong enough times, you can change the definition of the word. Okay? Or take a, like an old English word like suffer. What does suffer mean now? Yeah, to have pain. But you know, suffer used to mean just like to, to be patient. Okay? You can kind of see how it would make that progression. You suffer through a situation, you, you have patience for the situation, you endure the suffering of it, you get to the other side. But it definitely means two different things. Suffer just used to mean be, to be patient with something, and suffer now means to endure pain. Okay? But in math, it never happens. You can't use the word factor wrong enough times and change what a factor is. Factor is a factor forever. This definition of factor, no matter which race of aliens comes in contact with it, it's still true. It's airtight. And it's like, really, I wrote really big, so this is maybe one or two lines long. And it's done. Factor is defined very well, and it can't, you can't be mistaken about it. As long as you always consult it, you'll always know what a factor is. Okay. So if there's something that I want to cancel out, a common factor, then I need to be able to write it as that thing times something else. That's what we're working on right here. If I can factor out a 2x from the numerator and denominator, then the numerator has to have a factor of 2x, and the denominator has to have a factor of 2x. You see where I'm going on this long-winded diatribe? Yeah. Okay. If I want to cancel out a 2x, then it has to be a factor of the numerator and a factor of the denominator. And by the definition of factor, that means I have to write it as the product of two things to get the, in this case, the numerator or the denominator. And having to write it this way is the easiest way to challenge your brain to say, is this possible? Rather than say words like factor out or undistribute or whatever, just think about it. Can I, can I write it as this fraction times some other fraction? Let's take another. Um, let's see, let's get the color going here. Uh, this shows up, doesn't. Okay. That's, that's terrible. Right, just go back to white. Um, let's take uh, 2x squared plus 4 over 6. Here's a big mistake right here. I see it a lot. It's like this. 2, 6. That's 1. That's 3. So x squared plus 4 over 3. No. Feels reasonable enough. It looks reasonable enough. I just crossed out a common factor, didn't I? Wait a minute. 2 and 6 have a common factor of 2, don't they? OK. The question is not, does a number in the numerator have a common factor with a number in the denominator? but does the numerator of the whole thing have a common factor with the whole thing the denominator? Okay, so let's back it up. If I want to cancel out a factor of, okay, buddy, you're there, I see ya. Come over here again. If I want to cancel out a factor of two, then let's, so 
last four examples we've gone through, write it like this. The factor that I want to cancel out over the factor that I want to cancel out times some other fraction. Let's start in the denominator because it's going to be easiest. What do we put here in this? No, three, three. Two times three is six. I'm not going to ask for a, you know, to somebody to throw it out there. I want you to think about it a second. We won't have to put in the numerator. Don't shout it out. What would I put in the numerator so that two times that thing would give me the original numerator? So you think about it. You individually give it some thought. Or, you know, ten times. we go here, so that when I multiply the 2 across everything here, I get 2x squared plus 4. 1x squared plus 2. Let's double check. If I multiply 2 times this whole thing, I have to distribute, right? Don't forget about that. Multiply the numerators together. So I have to multiply it by everything. 2 times x squared is 2x squared. 2 times 2 is 4. I was able to do it. I was able to write it as 2 over 2, the factor that I want to cancel times some other fraction that looks simpler, right? It's important that it looks simpler because we're trying to simplify fractions here. Uh, and it equals the original fraction. So I'm able to cancel out the two factors of two, and now I have a simple fraction. x squared plus two over three. All right, so I'm going to give you a few, and you see what you think. Tell me if, if you can simplify, simplify it. If you can't, then stop. It's better to stop and not do anything than to just charge ahead and do something that you know is wrong. Okay, if you're not sure if it's wrong, but if then it's okay. But if you have any hesitation about it, you're not sure that you're supposed to be able to do that, then just stop. And don't do it the wrong way. Don't learn it the wrong way and then have to get deprogrammed later and then uh, learn it the right way. So let's start with uh, Let's start with uh, 14 minutes over 20. So they are four problems for you to uh, work for the next few minutes. I'll come around and see how we're doing. All right, well, let's reconvene and see can these fractions be simplified. What do you think about the first one? Just do you think you can simplify it? Yes. yes. Okay, so it must have a common factor, right? And one way to make sure we don't miss anything strange, uh, to make sure that we're finding a common factor definitely is to first identify the factor that you think cancels. What do you think cancels? 14. So you think a factor of 14 in the numerator and denominator? Yeah. Okay. So you must be able to write it as a 14 over 14 fraction, which will then become what? What is 14 over 14? 1. 1. Right. That's what's happening when we cancel these common factors. The 14 divides the 14. Okay. As long as we can write another fraction over here, multiply, and we get this guy, then we'll be good. So what do we put in the numerator? X. X. And in the denominator? 2. Does that work? Yeah. Yes, definitely. Yeah, okay. So 14 divides 14, we're left with x over 2. That's the end of the simplified fraction. Uh, how about the second one? Do you think it can be simplified? Mm -hmm. yeah. And what factor do you feel like? 3x <coughs> Three Three squared, that whole thing. All right. If 3x squared cancels, then we should be able to take it and, and write 3x squared over 3x squared times some other fraction and get back to this. So what do we put in the numerator to get? Three. 9x squared is 3. 3 times 3 is 9, and x squared times 9 is 10x squared. In the denominator, put it in x. 5x, 3 times 5 is 15, x squared times x is x to the third. So double check, make sure, yes, it works. 3x, divided, 3x squared divided by 3x squared is 1, 3 over 5x. 
take a look. Any more factors? No, three five prime. There's no x's left here, so I'd rather be able to cancel anything there. All right. How about here? Do you feel like you can cancel this? What? X? Just an x. X over x. Right. Got to be possible. If we're going to cancel an x, to write it as x over x times the only fraction. Right, so what do we put here in the numerator? X plus two. X plus two, let's double check. X times X is X squared. Distribute X times two is two X. All right, what do we put in the denominator? X squared. X squared. Yeah, I mean, there's not much double checking to do there. X divided by X is one. X plus two over X squared is our new fraction. What about this X and this X? Should we cancel those? Yeah. We should? No, we can't. Oh, yes, we can. There's no two X in the same. There's no x here. So in other words, if I think I can cancel out that x, don't just cross things out, okay? Especially when you see addition and subtraction. So let that at least throw up an alarm signal, okay? If we can cancel out that x, we have to be able to write it as x over x times some other fraction. In the denominator, we can put x, right? x times x is x squared. And I can get started in the numerator. x times 1 is x. But how do I multiply x times something and get 2? We'll not go that far and say it's impossible. In fact, I'm going to go back over that. But we're kind of at a loss here. To this, it, whatever it is, it doesn't seem simple. 2 minus x? No. 2 x down. 2 like this? Yeah. So there it is. Cindy showing us that we could. 2 over x. Right. Think about that. If we did x times 2 over x, x, let's say over 1, times 2 over x. Right. Well, that x could cancel that x, and we would be left with 2. So there, it's not impossible. There is something that does work. The problem with it is this is my simplified fraction. In a fraction. A fraction in a fraction. Yeah, fractions in fractions, they're, they're unsavory. They're not wrong, but who wants to do that? Like if I wanted to plug an x, something in for x, I'd rather put it here. Add two to it, square it, divide. Done. Here I've got to take two divided by x. Now if I want to be, you know, like a proper mathematician, I'm going to add one plus whatever this fraction is, meaning I need to find a common denominator, add those together, divide that by whatever x was. Which means now I need to divide or multiply by the reciprocal of whatever this number is. It's, it just is more complicated. It's not simpler. Okay, this is simpler than that, but this is not simpler than that. Okay? But Cindy's right. She made my point for me that it's possible. It's just not simpler. Okay, here. Do you think we can cancel out here? No. No. We run into the same problem as we just discussed here. Right? I feel like we can cancel that x. Go like this. I made my first mistake. Okay, that's messing everything up. If it's possible, I need to be able to write it as x over x times some other fraction. Of course, denominator is easy. X times 1 is x. x times x is x squared. x times negative 4 is negative 4x. But when we try to get that 3, we would have to do 3 over x. And this is not simpler than that. That's simplifying rational expressions. Big emphasis on this big, I don't know, 10 times underlined word, factor. If we're trying to simplify a fraction and we're not canceling common factors, we're making a huge mistake. Okay. And with, with simple enough, you know, uh, just fractions, real world fractions, I don't think we make that kind of mistake anymore. We're definitely looking for common factors. But we forget to look for factors, especially when we have what are called polynomials in the numerator and denominator. We need to have a factor of this whole thing. Remember that. If, I mean, you don't want to make that mistake. You don't want to violate the, the weeping kitten theorem. Okay, You can see here, hopefully you can see, we have x squared plus 2x plus 1 over x squared plus 3. And if you just cancel out these x squareds and write it as 2x plus 1 over 3, and somewhere in the world, Kind of like the, the Tinkerbell theorem. 
but it's kittens. The kitten just breaks down in tears because someone an expert in dance has learned not, not to have been. Okay? Uh, there's a, there's a, a teacher who actually originated the, uh, this theorem, and it's a bit stronger. There are strong and weak forms of theorems, and the strong form is something worse than this little cat. But I don't need that. That form. It's a little bit gentler. Just be careful when you go willingly crossing things out and then rewriting them and never asking yourself, is this a common factor between the numerator and the denominator? All right. So be, if, if this is at all new, if you thought for a second that you could simplify this fraction, or not that one, or this one, you need this information. Okay? So keep it somewhere that you can refer to it or study it until it's internalized, not until you memorize it, but until you understand, I see, I need a common factor. I've underlined the word factor in my mind. It's very important, I know that. All right, so now, I have what's the distributive property there, but we're gonna put that to when we, when we use that a little bit more. I'll show you a visual of what the distributive property is and why we do what we do when we use the distributive property, okay? Why do I take that three and multiply it by everything We'll look at a picture of why that is. So, but not, not today, I've changed my mind. Okay, so what do I suppose to I'm gonna, I need a quick second to put this together. I just need to kind of bring it over from another class and take the writing off so we can reuse that slide because I forget that a lot. So I'm just gonna give you guys a couple minutes, stretch and talk and take a little break. Right? You've been doing fantastic. Talking about, talking about exponents here, just want to be sure you understand what exponents are and what's being communicated, okay? So I want you to, this is, this exponents are just a shortcut for multiplying a bunch of times, right? Just a shortcut. Somebody in, in the history of math wanted to save time on writing five times five times five times five times five times five. Times, five times. It got to be really uh, tiring. So I said, well, let me just take five, I'll write a little number up there, and that'll be the number of times I multiply five by itself. Just like Multiplication is shortcut for addition. Two times three is two plus two plus two. Right? So I just want you to unshortcut it. I want you to write it out the long way. So just to be clear, this example would be times a times a times a. Let's do that for all of all for the remaining five. Press that. Right. So this four up here is what we call the superscript writing that's above the, the other writing. This number is an exponent. This exponent tells me how many times to multiply the number that's right there below it by itself. So the question is, you know, what is this superscript of? What does it apply to? What is it that it wants me to multiply by itself? Just the A. Just the A. <coughs> right. If you have 4A times 4A, can I just do Make it two pen strokes and turn this into this so that this would be correct. What would I use? Parentheses, universal sign for parentheses, just like this. <coughs> That's what you would do. You would put parentheses around the four as well as the a, so now that this whole thing, 4a, is a number that I'm raising to the second power and that I therefore want to multiply by itself. But until I use those parentheses, like down here, 5a to the third. Until I use those parentheses, that square really only applies to the A. Okay. So four times A times A. Yeah. <coughs> um, it's if you wrote four times A times A, that's great. I bet if I is if I phrase this in a little bit of a different way, if I said Substitute for a negative three. I saw this mistake on uh, quite a few tests. Here's the mistake that happens four, and you put the negative three there. You know what happens after that? I see negative twelve squared. Okay. Right? It happens a lot, so there's no need to be incredulous about it. Uh, but because there's a four and there's a negative three, four times negative three is negative 12. I mean, if we, if we 
we took a second and, and really analyzed it, I think we would all agree that what I'm trying to communicate, especially with this parentheses, is pretty clear what I want to have happen, right? Here's, the, I mean, the two is right above this parentheses, and there's the end of the parentheses. Like, that is the thing that I want to have raised to the second power, that is the thing that I want to multiply by itself twice, right? But this happens all the time. Four times negative two first, and then raise it to the second power. This is gonna be much, much bigger than this thing here. This is just gonna be uh, negative three times negative three is nine times four is 36. I think, what is this? 144. Positive. Yeah. 144, it's much bigger than 36, right? Because now we're taking a bigger number, two a power. Powers make uh, very big numbers. Exponents make very big numbers. So we want to think about those kinds of things. What am I trying to communicate? That's a very important part of math. What am I trying to get across to you? What is it that I want you to execute? Right? Um, and further along here, we start to get into these things called properties of exponents, which I for, for some things like exponents, I wish we didn't write it down in books and tables and make it look like this is the right way and, and the only way that you can know it is to memorize it, okay? There's a property of exponents that we're about to exhibit here just by writing this out the long way, okay? So I, I'm raising something to the third power. Raising something to the third, third power means I want to do what? Cube it, cubing means? Multiply itself three times. Multiply three of those things together. Yeah. Okay. What is the thing that I want to multiply by itself three times? A over three. A over three. So I write a over three times a over three times a over three, and that's exactly right. If I did that, you know, the long way, then I would have to write the right uh, result. A really common mistake. This is not equal to this thing. It's a mistake. <coughs> is to write this. We see this a lot. It happens all the time. To the best of us, even. We just kind of are rushing through and we put the three with the A and not, well, what's the mistake here? But both of these would both, if I wrote this out the long way, wind up getting multiplied by themselves three times, right? All the way straight across, A to the third, straight across, we get three to the third, there we go. That's a property of exponents. If you have a fraction, you raise it to a power, then the numerator and denominator both get that power. Is that a magic trick? Is that something you need to memorize? Absolutely. Okay, I'm just taking this fraction and multiplying it by itself this many times. When I multiply fraction, I multiply straight across, so there's going to be that many a's and that many threes. So they're both going to get multiplied by themselves that many times. How about this guy over here? Here's a three, here's parentheses, here's the end of the parentheses, so here is the thing. Here's the thing that I want you to raise the third power. Okay. Here's what happens a lot, even more so than with the fractions. I just get this. Same? No. Not the same. This one is a little bit harder than this one, I think. This one is very, very clear. Very clear. Okay? Parentheses. Around an entire expression of some kind raised to the third power. Take what's inside the parentheses and multiply it by itself three times, right? So that thing that we're going to multiply three times, 5a. 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 This is close, sort of. Right? Is there an a to the third? Could we rewrite this using a to the third as part of it? Yeah. What else though? Thirteen. Well, it's not five plus five plus five. It's five times oh, five okay. times five. So it would be one hundred and twenty-five, which is five to the third. Think about what is being said in. Algebraic expressions. Okay. Think about what the person who wrote it down is trying to communicate to you. Right. Like this guy right here. I'm raising something to the third power, meaning I want to multiply something by itself three times. What is the thing that I want to multiply by itself three times? Two times a times a. Two times a times a. You even broke that down. That's good. Two times a times a times two times a times a times a times a. Times two times a, times a. Alright, well we have three twos. We multiply together using exponents. We express that, express that as two to the third. And now we have three things, one, two, three, three groups of two a's 
Okay. Does three groups of two A's sound familiar from like third grade? What, what does three groups of two mean? Three groups of two? Six. Multiplication, yeah, six. Right. Three groups of two, five groups of seven. This is what multiplication is. This is how we communicate it with English words, so it's, it's fairly easy to understand. I got three groups of two, three times two, that's six A's that I want to multiply together. It's not a tricky thing, right? I'm just counting all of the A's that I'm multiplying together. And yet, there's a lot of confusion. If I have A squared to the third, this is just a simpler version of this, I'll get a lot of this, because we're rushing and relying on our memories, our memory, our, our uh, our ability to remember the properties of exponents correctly, okay, and how we've remembered it incorrectly. But we don't need to remember them. We just need to say, what's going on here? A squared, that's two A's, get multiplied three times. So that's an A and an A, another A and an A, and a third A and an A, that's three groups of two A's, and six <coughs> A's that I want to multiply together. So that's A to the sixth, not fifth. Okay. And here's the big one, number one mistake in all of exponentdom. That would be to get 2 to the 4th plus a to the 4th. That's not what this is. That's not what's going on. How do I write this out longly? 2 plus a plus a times a. a times 2 plus a. This is going to take a minute. This is why we have exponents, because we don't want to write it out like this. But if need be, we should, so we don't make mistakes like this. Okay. If you just multiply 2 plus a times 2 plus a, you're going to get something more complicated than, I mean, you're going to get at least more terms than just two terms, right? This is two things. We're going to get three things when we multiply this out. Okay. So we want to be careful. We want to treat exponents as what they are, shortcuts multiplication, multiply things by themselves that many times. Now, let's quickly talk about the radical. The radical would be, anybody know what the radical is? A radical? Anybody tell me what a radical is? Do you remember that word? Yes. Okay, do you remember that word? Okay. This is a radical. Simple. Okay. What would you call that symbol? The problem is, it's not always a square root symbol. Let's talk about the square root, though. It's the square root of 25. Why? Like, what's the proof of that? It's 5 times 5 is 25. It equals 5 because 5 times 5 is 25. Yeah. It's the inverse of exponents. The roots are inverse of exponents. They go the opposite way. 5 squared is 25, square root of 25 is 5, goes back. Uh, if I put a little 3 there, do you remember what that means? Can you guess what that means? Maybe if I put that there's kind of an understood 2 to be right there, the square root, second root. And if it's the inverse of, of exponents, cancel each other out. Well, they do cancel each other out, but. <coughs> You square something to get 25, and that thing is the square root of 25. And you cube something to get 64, and that thing is the cubed root of 64. Can you figure out that, what that is? <coughs> yeah? Yeah, like multiply something three times. Yeah, multiply something three times by itself to get 64. So what is that number that you multiply by itself three times to get 64? Four? Four? Check it out. 4 times 4 times 4. If that comes out to be 64, then yeah, 4 is the cube root of 64. It is 4, and that is 64. <coughs> okay. That's the cube root of 64. What's the cube root of 125? 5. 5. We, kind of, we, we talked about this a little bit earlier. We already did 5 to the third is 25. The cube root of, of, uh, of 125 is 5 because 5 times 5. Now we've got a few minutes left, and I want to now uh, 
I get on my soapbox every now and then, and this is one of those times, and it's about the order of operations. Okay, so. Uh, watch a little video by uh, a very, very smart guy. And let me just set it up so the sound comes through. If you went to elementary school in the U.S. or much of the rest of the world, you almost certainly learned about something boringly called the order of operations, a set of rules for whether or not you should do multiplication before addition or addition before subtraction to get the right answer on your math test. Except you don't always get the right answer, or even one answer. I mean, is 8 minus 2 plus 1 equal to 5 or 7? And is 6 divided by 3 divided by 3 equal to 2 thirds or 6? The problem is, focusing on the order of operations can lead to ambiguity and obscures the real, underlying, and often beautiful mathematics. A mathematician will tell you that 8 minus 2 plus 1 is really 8 plus negative 2 plus 1, which is unambiguously equal to 7, even though the so-called order of operations standard in the US tells you the answer is 5. If you want 5 for your answer, then you really need some parentheses. But why is this ambiguity even possible? It's because, fundamentally, all of these operations are simply different procedures that start with two numbers and combine them in some way to give you one number. Each operation takes two numbers as input, two and no more. If you want to be entirely unambiguous and pedantic, every single pair of numbers in any algebraic expression should be inside parentheses, and then there's no need to know any order of operations. Just evaluate the innermost parentheses first and work outwards, collapsing them down pairwise like a championships bracket. But it turns out that's not the only way. It's possible to change the order in which you do the operations, to rearrange the parentheses, as long as you know what the underlying mathematics is. For example, if you want to add 3 plus 4 and then multiply the result by 5, you can either do the addition first and get 7 times 5 equals 35, or you can do the multiplication first, as long as you know that multiplication distributes across all the terms in the parentheses. That is, 5 times 3 plus 5 times 4 equals 15 plus 20 equals 35. The same answer. And how do we know multiplication distributes? One way is to draw rectangles, but I've done that before. The same rearranging can be done for exponentiation and multiplication. 3 times 2 all squared, or 6 squared equals 36, is the same as 3 squared times 2 squared, 36. It even works for addition and subtraction. 5 minus 1 plus 2 is 5 minus 1 minus 2. So the true order of operations is this. Use parentheses and learn what exponentiation, multiplication, addition, and the rest are really doing. Then you can proceed however you want. That's not to say that we don't have a conventional order of operations in mathematics. I mean, deciding that we evaluate multiplication before addition allows us to get rid of lots and lots of redundant parentheses. And noticing that 1 plus 2 plus 3 equals 1 plus 2 plus 3, and 2 times 3 times 4 equals 2 times 3 times 4, removes a ton more. But the point is that those parentheses are still there, still implied, just like how 3 minus 4 is secretly implying 3 plus negative 4, and 3 divided by 4 is really 3 times 1 fourth. But anytime the result might be ambiguous, you really need to use parentheses. Then you can proceed in whatever order you want. The order of operations learned in school, however, is different. It's a mechanical set of instructions that dictates just one of the many ways you can do algebra. It locks you into a single path through the beautiful mathematical landscape, which, while necessary for a computer whose goal is merely to give you the right answer, doesn't really give any insight onto what it is that you're doing when you do algebra. So while the order of operations isn't technically wrong, because most of the time they'll give you the standard answer, it's morally wrong, because it turns humans into robots. So, uh, if you've ever gotten hung up on what's the right order to do this in, the answer is there isn't one. There isn't a right order to do it in. Okay. Uh, I'm sure you've all seen this. I write it a little bit differently because it kind of illustrates. At the end of this little speech, you're going to accept there is an order of operations because it does have an advantage. Okay. We'll talk about that, but I've seen too many students get. Start packing up. We got time. 
Um, too many students have gotten confused by the order of operations and feel like it is, if they don't know the order of operations, then it's wrong. Uh, that's not the case. Did anybody pick up on, it talks really fast, so it might, you might not have picked up on it, but did anybody pick up on why we have an order of operations? Like it, it's just a little bit more convenient. It saves us having to write a bunch of parentheses. And you see that long thing they did the parentheses? Because then he said, if we just agree, it's just an agreement. It's not a right way or a wrong way. It's just we agree that I'll do multiplication before I do addition. I'll, all the things that get multiplied together, multiply those together, and then we'll move on to addition and subtraction. Agreeing to that allows us to eliminate a bunch of parentheses. Right? Save a lot of ink, a lot of petroleum. Right? That's really the idea behind it. We just don't want to take all the time to group things together with parentheses, so we're just going to say, let's agree to do certain things first, okay? So we could just get rid of everything here and just use parentheses, and that would be the order of operations. Follow all the parentheses wherever you see them, do those things in parentheses first, and then move on once those things are, you know, combined together, right? And that would make a lot of sense. But because we want to save ourselves on parentheses, uh, we want to agree to do certain things problem is, uh, like the example that he gave, 6 divided by 3 divided by 3. Okay. I know <coughs> that there is a standard way of doing this, but the truth about this, it is not a very well constructed, let's call it a sentence. Okay. Just like this one. Uh -huh. Okay. This is probably not saying what it's, the person who wrote it down is not trying to say what, it's, what the sentence is saying, right? They're trying to call grandma to come eat. They're not saying let's eat grandma, they're missing a comma. It was not very well constructed, okay? Uh, and neither is this. I can write it like this if I accept that there's a standard word of operations, all right? But it's not because that's the right way. It's just the way that we agree to do it, okay? Standard Order of operations would say just work this thing left to right. Okay, so do the first division on the left, right? Treat that as the first division. Six divided by three is two. Divided by three is two thirds. Right? If I want you to violate that order, I can put parentheses around this. Right? And now I'm forcing you with the parentheses. No because it's at the top of the order, but because parentheses are things that group things together, right? They're a natural human thing that we use, right? So don't get too hung up on that. But let me quickly explain. Multiplication and division are equal, right? They have as much power as one half of them before the other, just work it from left to right. That's why I have ten doctors that way. Have a good day.